Hey everybody, it's Colin Hansen here, one of the hosts of Life and Books and Everything. I think you're going to enjoy the episode that we have for you today, talking with my new boss, Julius Kim, the president of the Gospel Coalition. Before we get on with the podcast, I wanted to tell you about a new title that I think you want to check out from our friends at Crossway. The book is Weep With Me, How Lament Opens a Door for Racial Reconciliation. It's written by Mark Vrogup. Mark Vrogup is the pastor of College Park Church in Indianapolis. Uh, He's a friend. He's a council member for the Gospel Coalition. This book is an effort to bridge the canyon, I think it's very timely, of misunderstanding, insensitivity, and hurt on issues of race relations. And Mark introduces the concept, biblical concept of lament, and to be able to help us to bridge that canyon. He invites us to mourn with him over the brokenness that has caused division and, and uses lament to begin that journey toward a diverse and united church. The book also includes prayers of lament from a number of different people, John on Wuchekwa, Isaac Adams, Danny Aiken, Micah Edmondson, and I also contributed one of those laments. So the book from Crossway, Weep With Me, How Lament Opens a Door for Racial Reconciliation by Mark Vrogup. Check it out. Now, on with the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Life and Books and Everything. Our loyal listeners, I'm going out on a limb there with the plural. Could be singular. Thanks, Mom. But good to, good to have you all with us. We have a very special treat. Our very first, and hopefully not our very last, but opportunity to have a guest into the virtual studios. We have with us the Right Honorable, Esteemed Reverend Doctor, whatever titles, El Presidente, El Guapo, known to some, Julius Kim. Julius, very good to have you here on Life and Books and Everything. We'll be hearing from Julius in just a moment, since Julius comes to us from the world of the seminary, still has a role there, though now president, we are thankful, president of the Gospel Coalition. I thought we'd start, Colin and Justin, I'd love to hear from you. What was your experience in seminary? Uh, any you know, listeners who are wondering about seminary, uh, is it worth it? Uh, what did you gain? Where did you go? What was that like for you? We're a big fan of seminaries here on the show. Uh, Colin, start with you. I graduated, Kevin, from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School back in 2010, so Julius and I have that in common, though he was getting a PhD while I was getting the MDiv. But one of the big advantages of of seminary, especially uh, Trinity's not huge, but it's also not small. You have a chance to be able to get to know your professors in many cases. I was really blessed to be hired by one of my professors at the end of a seminary, Don Carson, and then One of my other major influences and mentors, which I share with Julius in this regard, is John Woodbridge. And so uh, one of the things I remember, in addition to everything else that I learned, which was wonderful uh, in the MDiv curriculum, one of the things I learned from John was not only being an eyewitness of much of evangelical history and a man of many fascinating stories, but um, I just remember his encouragement to use Whatever God's, whatever gifts God had given me to build up the church, uh, to encourage the church. My my bent as an editor and a journalist is naturally analytical and often critical. And one of the things that that John did for me was to just encourage me to to flip that around and say, use those gifts to be able to to tell encouraging stories. So he and I worked on a book together called The God Size Vision: Revival Stories That Stretch and Stir, which was built off that relationship that we had and. I'll just never forget that. I mean, I can look back and another another common friend of ours, Scott Manich, just a huge influence on my life, uh, not even so much in, in what he taught, but in his manner, in his, his churchmanship and the way he led his family. And I think that's one thing that's very different from what you'll often get in high school. You're dip, often you'll, you'll get this different from your college experience in many cases, especially if you went to a research university. But that was life changing for me in seminary, and I'm really, really glad I went, and and glad I went to Trinity. Colin, I remember years ago you giving 
one great piece of advice. I mean, I haven't heard any since then, but I remember this one really <laughs> stuck with me. I, and I just thought of it when you mentioned John Woodbridge. I don't know if it came from him or it just came from you, but it was maybe after some time after, you know, I wrote the emergent book. And I remember you saying as a young man, and we were all 10 years younger then, that uh, you, you wanted to try to write things where it would be to your advantage to be young or to your advantage yeah. given your yeah. state in life, which really yeah. just clicked for me. That was one of the things to write why we're not emergent as uh, you know, Ted and I were 30 or thereabouts early thirties was a plus. Whereas you have 30 year olds writing their second memoir or writing their parenting book, or mm -hmm. not that there couldn't be good gospel insight there in your marriage or parenting book, but that was just made a lot of sense. And I pass it on to other people who want to write often. I'll say, try to find what, what's the hook. What's the angle? Why should people listen to you? And it's not about your story, but use who you are, where you are to lend some extra interest or credibility. Was that just your insight? I think that, I think that's my insight from publishing. Um, just that you'll you'll find writers who they read John Piper, they read J.I. Packer, and then they want to imitate them. And I think, I mean, I'm sorry, but you probably don't have those gifts. But then on top of that, you're also probably decades younger than they were when they produced that. And so it's very difficult to try to more or less compete with them in a marketplace of ideas. You need to write from a perspective that where your youth becomes an advantage. And so that's why we're not emergent. That's young, restless, reformed trying to tell stories and observe trends that are only discernible when you're younger. But then, of course, that's also a, a viewpoint that can change with time. And now, Kevin, you're in a position where you can write some of those theological works um, and because you've built up knowledge. I mean, I, I'll say this about seminary. I kind of thought I knew some things going in there because I had a good undergraduate education. I worked for four years at Christianity Today before there. But I can't tell you how often I go back to what I learned in those three years of seminary. It's so foundational to what I know. And, and it's, it's also enabled me to be a lifelong learner. If you learn nothing else in seminary, to, to help, help you to know what to study for the long haul in ministry and in life, then you miss something. But that's what it did. That's what it did for me. And I'm really grateful. Justin, tell us about your seminary experience. Yeah, my wife and I, I got married in the summer of 98. And the Day after the honeymoon, we moved up to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and became part of what was then called the Bethlehem Institute, TBI, which is over the years now morphed into Bethlehem College and Seminary. Different um, than TMI. That was a different... I was thinking the same uh -huh. thing, but you yeah, said Yeah, it. okay. <laughs> Although we did discover that TBI stands for traumatic brain injury. I don't think <laughs> had thought that through ahead of time. Yeah. Probably uh, also too much information, I would yeah, say. Yeah, true. <laughs> Uh, so I'm privileged to serve on the board of trustees there now and uh, really have a heart for that school. And uh, yeah, we, we don't have enough time on the podcast to enumerate all the ways in which it has influenced me, uh, hopefully for the good. I think the biggest thing about starting with, I'll just call it Bethlehem College and Seminary, um, is that it was a church-based educational program. So in terms of the rigor of the exegesis, you needed to pass a Greek entrance exam to get into it. Um, we're doing very serious exegesis, very serious theological reading, not as much historical theology in those days, but it was very rigorous academically, um, but it was all done in the context of the local church. So you're being mentored by uh, church elders who are sitting in on church meetings, um, it had a great impact on me, not only to be learning a theology of suffering from books, but to see the young mother with cancer uh, dying and uh, needing to get gospel hope and then minister to the congregation. So that, that tendency that there is historically to kind of separate out the church and the academy uh, to start my theological education in a context where those two were deeply integrated together. Uh, was just a wonderful gift for me. Then ended up going to Crossway, um, and the TBI program was not designed to be a four-year uh, seminary MDiv, so I ended up completing my education uh, at the graduate level through RTS, through distance, through traveling down, taking a week-long intensive classes. 
uh, before going on and doing the PhD. Great. Okay, Julius, where did you go to s- seminary? Yeah, I went to Westminster Seminary in California for my MDiv. Okay. And then after that, did did work at Trinity, as Colin mentioned, for my PhD in historical theology. Who, who was there at oh, Westminster, California, when you were there in the whatever age you want to be? Yeah, this is the this is the early '90s when I was there. We had some of the original men that came from Westminster, Philadelphia. And so for those of you that are interested in history, Westminster, California was established in 1979 at the 50 year anniversary of Westminster, Philadelphia's establishment. And so this was the brainchild of Edmund Clowney, one of my mentors, I can talk about him in a little bit, Uh, but he wanted to create a West Coast branch, originally was set for San Francisco, Hmm. but they couldn't find the the, the property, they were just too expensive and not enough churches there locally to support this new work. So they ended up in Los Angeles, couldn't find enough support in Los Angeles. And then there was a little church down here in Escondido that had some property and some families and stuff. So that's how they came to Escondido. Also a little, little trivia fact. I think they also came to Escondido because our first president, Robert Strimple or Bob Strimple, he was a systematician, was really the, uh, the, the handpicked successor to John Murray, Bob Strimple had respiratory issues. And so living in San Francisco was just too moist and, and, and Los Angeles had too much smog. And so providentially, San Diego worked out perfectly uh, in terms of the temperate weather and, um, and the, 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 mm. the climate here in Escondido, which we're actually a little bit inland, is a lot more like a desert. So it's a lot more dry. Uh, so that's how Westminster, California ended up in Escondido, California. Did they have a vision so, for California right from the get-go? I mean, I could understand we want to do something out west, but they could have said Kansas City's west or Dallas or Denver. Was this, We want to go as far west as we can before touching the ocean? Correct. So I think the vision was beyond the West for the Pacific Rim. Uh, and so their vision was to reach the world through the West Coast, uh, at least this side of the, of, of, of the West Coast so or the United States. And so that was part of the original vision, from what I understand, was they wanted to have an entree to the to the Pacific Rim. Interesting. Yeah. So then you uh, went to TEDS from there? I did. Right? Yeah. To Trinity do your, PhD, to do your School. PhD work? Correct. So John John Woodbridge was my mentor, and I worked with him and another fellow that you know there in Alabama, now Doug Sweeney. Oh, uh, Doug cool. was also a church historian there at the time, and so he was my second reader. So I worked with Doug and John on on Restoration England, so early modern English history on the Anglican Church. Now, come on. Why that, Julius? Hmm? Well, why that area of study? I mean, you, you have, obviously you have the interest in preaching um, and assume you wanted to be a pastor at the time, but what was the draw towards historical theology in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I There was actually no interest in even in a PhD early on when I was getting my MDiv. I wanted to be a pastor. And then as I was going through my MDiv, my wife and I, as we were praying, we felt a heart to be involved with training leaders in countries that just didn't have as many opportunities that we do here, for example, in the United States, namely Bible colleges and seminaries. And so we started praying about potential missions work. I wanted to be a missionary, more specifically a missionary, not only t- planting churches, but also training future pastors. That really was a was a heartbeat of mine or a desire of mine. And so when I mentioned it to my mentor, Ed Clowney, he actually suggested that I get a PhD. I had no desire to be a PhD, to do a PhD and no desire for academic work. Uh, but he felt like that would open up more, up more doors overseas as well, getting a PhD. We didn't have children at the time, so we thought, you know, this is the time to do it. As you get older, it gets more difficult to do a PhD. So just go do the PhD and then go overseas with that PhD in hand. And little did I know that he had actually other plans as well. Uh, Dr. Clowney was a tremendous uh, friend, father, father figure, et cetera. And as I was finishing up, as I was finishing up my PhD, working on my dissertation there in Chicago, I got a call from him saying there's an opening at uh, Westminster, California, actually in PT. And because he didn't tell me this was because he was finally retiring. He had retired several times before, but then he moved out to Escondido to teach part-time to help the practical theology department to be with his family. He had a daughter and her family here in California. And uh, he was going to leave for good, and he wanted somebody to take his place. And he had thought of me as that person. He never told me that. I only found out after he died from his from his widow, from Jean. 
uh, that his desire was for me to come back to teach preaching and pastoral ministry at at uh, Westminster, California. So he saw something in me that I didn't even see myself. And uh, so for that, I'm external, eternally grateful for his wisdom and um, leading in my life. So all that to say, that's a, that's a very long way of saying. So he suggested, there, as you know, Justin, there's not many PhDs in preaching um, unless you go overseas, like to Holland, maybe even England, and you design your own dissertation, essentially. So he suggested church history because it's a broader avenue by which you can actually buy, um, read a lot in the area of, of, of preaching. And so uh, long story short, I, was, I, I got connected to John Woodbridge. I wanted to study church history. I also wanted to be a good churchman. John was really influential in that area. I went to John to actually study Reformation church history. I was, I was interested in a, a French friend of Calvin, an evangelist by the name of Pierre Viret. Mm -hmm. Uh, Viray, more known for his 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 work on government and politics and church to church state relations, lesser greater magistrates and how to relate. Uh, I think Calvin gets a lot of that from Viray, but I was interested in him as a preacher because even in the 16th century, uh, especially in France, he would command crowds of five six thousand people in evangelistic settings. So I was, I was intrigued by that. Is wait a minute, here's a reformer, a friend of Calvin having these evangelistic meetings of five, 6,000 people. So I wanted to study a little bit more of his theology and his theology of preaching. Uh, long, and then this is getting, this long story short is getting longer, unfortunately. And then I was taking a seminar with John Wordbridge on the origins of the enlightenment. Fascinating, fascinating period of study. That's one of his areas of specialty. He's, a, he's an enlightenment scholar. And as we were going through this seminar on the origins of the enlightenment, I was fascinated by a group of English rationalists by the name of latitudinarians. They were called latitudinarians by their enemies. Now, I was fascinated how they popularized their understanding of rational religion through especially their preaching. And so I, I got interested in, in their sermons, started reading a bunch of 17th century Anglican sermons. Uh, talk about things that helped put your wife to sleep when I started reading <laughs> these sermons to her. Um, but uh, so that, that launched a whole kind of area of study in the history of preaching. Uh, so that's another area that I started reading more and more upon, um, going all the way back to Chrysostom and others, um, but especially in the 17th century, uh, Anglican rationalism. And, and, and so my primary sources of understanding that period and their theology and their preaching and their understanding of the relationship between church and state in England was sermons. And I think that was kind of really the foundation of my teaching preaching. So, Julius, um, you studied John Tillotson then. <clears throat> That's right. One of the major. I mean, he was for the next hundred years. Maybe. I mean, he he was the guy that if you were interested in English speaking preaching, uh, it was him. Whether I mean, even evangelicals liked him. Everybody wanted John Tillotson. So, do you think uh, now? I think if anybody's heard of him in our circles, it'd be sort of eh, latitudinarian rationalist. Uh, is that fair, or have we been too hard on him as a preacher? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's essentially my dissertation. Yeah. Is that I think the the current current um, assessments of of John Tillotson and his friends are probably a little unfair. They essentially just for for at least conservative evangelical preachers in our in our world, John would come across as a fairly it's like a winter day, like cold and breezy, right? That's what they call the Anglican sermons of the day. Just cold and breezy. Uh, uh, emphasizing the rational parts of religion, the rational yeah. parts of Christianity. De-emphasizing the supernatural, for example. Emphasizing morality over and against doctrine. And it's kind of like the, the deeds over the creeds, right? If we can say that. And so for those of us that are interested in creeds and the importance of the intersection of creeds and deeds, Doctrine and Life, um, John would come across too much as a moralist, which had a proper gospel foundation. Now, did John believe the gospel? I believe so. I believe so. In fact, he spent the latter years of his life defending himself against those who considered him a Socinian or a, an Arian, an anti-Trinitarian. So he, he believed in all that. So it was a matter of, 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 a degree, of difference in degree, not in kind. It was his emphasis, right, for his day. For his time, as he looked across his 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 world, which was England, right, London and and England, having gone through the wars of religion, 
you know, people dying over their view of transubstantiation, for example, or not holding transubstantiation. He said, do we really, should we really shed blood over mystical doctrines like that? But it wasn't just the Catholics, right? It was also the Puritans. The Puritans are shedding blood over predestination. It's like, really, does anybody really believe in predestination? John Tillich would say. But that's not even the point. Why would we have to kill one another over doctrines like transubstantiation on the one hand, the Catholics, or predestination on the other hand, these, these Puritans? So what we need for England, what we need for communal stability, for political, civil stability, we need a rational religion. Furthermore, this is the onset of, of the scientific the scientific, the rise of science in the 17th century and trying to understand our world through mechanistic forces and not just by faith. And so what he was afraid of was the, the onset of not only deism, but also atheism. So he said, we need now, we need to offset not only these wars of religion, but we need to offset all these folks that say that no way God doesn't exist. We can, we can explain why the world turns the way it does through mathematics and astronomy. So he said, we need a, re a religion that's reasonable, rational, but also ethical. And so there, what I tried to do is just argue in my dissertation that there are reasons why he chose to emphasize those elements of Christianity, because that's the context he was in. So in his context, do I understand him? Absolutely. Now, looking back and, and thinking about our own context here in the United States or in the world, is that the approach I would take? Probably not. Right. But I think you, to be good historians, we have to be fair to him in his context. So I, I want to come back to that, but throw it open here to Justin and, and Colin, because, I mean, I've had this thought before. It may sound strange, but that some of the, well, seeker sensitive is an old term now, mega church, those sort of pastors, we could all think of, you know, three or four, half a dozen prominent examples, have, th they're sort of the Tillotson of our day. Now, it's, you, you replace rationalism with relevance. They're, they're popular. Mm -hmm. They're gifted communicators. If you, if you scratch down deep enough, there's probably, yeah, not jettisoning the basic convictions of the gospel. And yet not wanting to emphasize those things that they see as divisive. Let's try to be bare bones. Let's, let's try to, Let's present this Christianity in a way that will have maximum palatability for the people in our day. So you read their sermons, they're going to seem as different as can be from Tillotson. But uh, I don't know, Colin, do you ever, have you ever made the connection between um, John Tillotson's sermons and uh, I, Willow uh, Creek? I don't think, don't think I have, Kevin. Uh, I just want to go back to the discipline of, of historical theology. And, no, no, don't hijack and... my thread. I want you to... <laughs> Do you have anything to say about well, that? And the then you can hijack I it. know nothing about John Okay, Tillotson. well, then don't talk about him. What about the, you know, just the... the... You discovered the one topic that Colin doesn't know anything about. <laughs> no. He also was a great-grandfather of a Civil War colonel. No, he wasn't. But I oh, was just no, hoping that was, that was he had me going there. I was like, "Is there a Tillotson like colonel that I'm missing here?" Tillotson somewhere? Beauregard. That's the. That's well, I, the I just, what I just want to echo in what you're saying there is the value of being able to understand people in their context. Um, it's easy to be, be able to just lift um, somebody. I mean, sometimes you can even you can read something from somebody, and you're thinking, "This is this is supposed to be that special." It really seems pretty basic to me until you realize, well, it's basic because that thing that that person wrote has changed world history and you don't even understand yourself or the world without this. Sometimes I feel that way about Augustine. Um, you just, oh, this seems kind of, uh, oh, right. Cause he's the one who made it up for the first time. And so I, I just, that was what I was thinking about in all this is the value of historical theology to be able to put people in their context, understand what issues they're addressing so we don't run into this challenge of being able to lift everything. And then also, I mean, I presume that it helps us to understand the first evangelicals or the awakening because it must have been a response to this, right? So I assume that our negative views toward that era is largely because of the seeming loss of the heart religion. But see, now we're at a time when heart religion seems to be everything, 
and evangelicals have a hard time connecting their heart religion back to their creeds. And so, Julius, I assume you, you've been able to bring that all the way back full circle, being in kind of a, a, a supremely creedal environment like Westminster. Yeah, for sure. Um, for me, it's been an interesting exercise as I moved from my my, my doctoral studies to a, a fairly, you know, as you know, fairly strong creedal confessional environment, a place like Westminster, where oftentimes, I think, frankly, unfairly, the 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 charge is leveled against us that we don't have we have big brains but very small hearts, uh, and even smaller maybe feet and hands, right? And I think that's unfair. But I think it's 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 worth at least discussing how in each generation of evangelicalism over the centuries, at least here in America, how you've seen this kind of this kind of pull push of emphases, whether it's doctrine, life, you know, p- personal piety. You know, I, I'm trying to think of that article. Maybe it was David Wells yeah. wrote an article a while back in that book, Reformed in America, where he talks about those three extremes, right? And I never saw them really as unique things, whereas it's more like a Venn diagram, right? There's the doctrinalists that really emphasize theology, and there's the the the, the, the transformationalists, right? And then there's the pietists. And I, I see when I look at evangelicalism in America, it's like it's like these. I, I'm remembering like this exercise machine called the Bowflex, where we kind of move one way or another, depending on how you want to do that. These like big rubber bands. And so for me, evangelicalism is like these rubber bands. I would stretch more to a doctrinalist, you know, emphasis or a personal pietistic em- emphasis or a more transformational emphasis, depending upon the leadership, the context, the issues of the day. And, and I think there's a lot we can learn from history in light of that. Yeah, I've often thought that seminaries, and I'm sure it's true with churches and people in general, but are are formed and have an identity around what what are we helping people not to be? So some seminary is come here because we're not liberals and others are, we're not TRs, the truly reformed, or we're not evangelicals by that meaning we're, we're reformed more than we are evangelical or we're not Kyperians or we're not two kingdoms or, uh, and, and some of that's inevitable. And I've always tried to be upfront with people that, you know, I, I'm shaped by seeing my team as the, the, the not liberals like the, those those are when I think of the kind of the bad guys we're trying to guard against at least in church circles it's theology going in that sort of direction but I've told that to students before as they look at seminaries to just try to and it's not that one has to be right and one has to be wrong but just try to gauge what they're responding to because that's going to give you a flavor I, I wanted to ask Julius, but I, I'd love for Colin and Justin to jump in as well, because all of us have been trained in seminary. Um, some of us have gone on to do other schooling after that, and all would have a heart to pastor people. And uh, I'm good friends with all of you and would would come to you as my pastor uh, at any point. And yet making your first calling and vocation a pastor is now what the other, th- the other three, the, you three guys have have done. So how have you thought through? Because I bet this 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 comes to a lot of guys. Um, went to seminary. I wanted to be a pastor, and uh, now you very much are a pastor, Julius. You have been for all these years, but you you get the the the, the point that I'm I'm making. You've seen your pastoral identity first through a professor, and then you know also serving a very meaningful way in the local church. How did you wrestle with that? How how can we help other guys wrestle with that? Uh, we don't want them to feel like they're not, you know, that they're a ministry failure if they get an MDiv and they they go into publishing or something. And on the other hand, we we don't want people to think that well, the real, you know, if you could be a professor, do that because I know I know a lot of guys who are you know pastors who think the professor gig is the really sweet gig, but then I actually know the professors that look and like, uh man, I would love to be a full-time pastor. That looks, I don't have to teach this, the same people the same things every every single year. So how did you wrestle with that pastor-professor dynamic? And Colin and Justin, I know you've thought through some of the same things in different ways. We'll start with you, Julius. Yeah, Kevin, I've, I've thought about that quite a bit, not only having been in 
in the in the teaching world for the last 20 years, but also been in, a pastor for the last 20 years while I've been teaching. But I think I think one of the things that I tell my students who oftentimes will come to me and ask me, you know, hey, hey, Dr. Kim, I know I'm getting an MDiv and I, I should be a pastor, but really the, the sweet gig is being a professor. I want to do what you do as if there's like this chain of being, right? Being a professor is high, is more spiritually higher than being a professor. And I don't know how many times I have to remind them. I said, I think you're one misunderstanding our calling. You're understand, just misunderstanding calling to begin with. You have to do what you're called to do and gifted to do. God gives gifts to the church and he helps them do their calling. And so if you're called to be a professor, you'll have certain gifts and the ability to do that. You may be called to be a pastor and you have to be faithful and do that as well. And so I think one of the things that I've tried to do is explain to them the importance of finding and discerning their calling. And, and for most, most guys in the seminary, the calling to the professor is very, namely, how should I say this? There's not many guys at the seminary that, that are called to be a professor. It takes a unique mind and heart and will, uh, in my opinion, uh, to be an academic and to go into that world. And so part of that's just discerning and learning and stirring the gifts and trying the gifts. But uh, that would be my initial kind of statement to them is just make sure you understand your calling and to obey that calling. I have more to say, but let me turn it over to the other brothers here and see what they think. So, Colin, how have you thought through? I remember having these very conversations with you, and I think there was a time where you really felt like, I I, want to be a, a local church pastor if I'm not doing that. You know what? Being the editor for the Gospel Coalition is something down the totem pole, and yeah. some of us even said we appreciate that instinct, and yet there's something very unique in what you can do in this role. So I'm, I'm yeah. answering the question for you like a bad host. Yeah. <laughs> How did you think through what to do with this pastoral urge? Yeah, well, I, I would agree with what Justin had said, which is that. I began to understand more clearly the calling as one toward eldership more broadly. And I felt like that was, that was a calling and that was a gifting that others had recognized in me, but it wasn't necessarily the same thing as working as a full-time pastor. Um, and then from there, I had to be able to differentiate between the internal call, which was the desire to be in that role, and then the external call. That was sort of stage two, the external call being an actual church that wants to pay you money to do this thing. And then a, a, a third layer right now, which is talking with, a, with, a, with an experienced pastor out of Australia. I was sharing my angst of, I mean, ever since I joined TGC, I had actually turned down Don Carson several times. And I said, I just, I want to be a pastor. Could you just let me do that? And finally he sort of said, okay, go ahead and, you know, just stay in touch, whatever. Well, when I talked with this friend from Australia, he said, you know what? You're probably only decent at your job at TGC because you'd rather be a pastor because it puts you in the mindset of the pastors and it puts you in the mindset of the, of the local church leaders. That's who you think of yourself as. And, and I'd say, especially under Julius's leadership as TGC seeks to serve the local church, that's very much our identity. It's the identity of the resources that we produce to come alongside, to be the best friend of church leaders, to help to equip and to train and to encourage them in all of their many giftings. And so I, I don't know if the Lord ever does have that in my future. Um, I, I've learned long since to leave that up to Him, and and I think I've been affirmed in what I've been doing for the last decade. So that's you know I'm, I'm I've just found the secret of contentment in that circumstance, and continue to fan and flame the desire to be a pastor. And just the fact is, in in the local church that I'm involved with. With our shepherding structure, there's about 150 people that fall under my responsibility as a shepherd. And so if I ever feel like I'm lacking in pastoral opportunities or, I mean, the need is right there in front of me. Nobody's stopping me from serving these people as a pastor, as an elder that I've been called to be in any way that I can. And so the only thing that stops me from doing it is my own willingness to serve in that capacity. So it's been a long process, and you're right, Kevin. We we walked through a lot of that, and um, with Justin mm -hmm. talking through that, a lot of that angst. But the Lord has been kind. Justin, 
Anything to add? Justin, in case you don't know, you could, uh, no one listening can see our sc- uh, squad cast glamour shots <laughs> and how they put in. If you don't put in your own name, they put a name for you. And Justin is communicative which keynote, no which is ironic because um, his communications <laughs> often flicker. And I'm kind Sith? Synth. Am I a kind Synth. Sith? Oh, Sith. No. Okay. <laughs> I, I always think of myself as a rather kind Sith. <laughs> And I'm more of a breakout Part. guy than a keynote usually, too. So that's really <laughs> yeah, that's true. Justin, do you have anything to to circle back to add on your own thoughts here? No, I would just encourage people to keep asking the question. Bobby Jameson is actually doing a, a book for Crossway on uh, how to aspire to be an elder, how to aspire to be a pastor. And it's sometimes really helpful to work through a book like that as you take somebody who's uh, gone through the path ahead of you. Uh, helps you to ask the right questions. I do think uh, we all here are products of evangelicalism and also critics of it. And uh, this is a, a broad generalization, but we tend to be individualistic as we think about our our calling and uh, you know just praying by myself and feeling something welling up inside of me. And I think we can learn from our, our Puritan uh, forefathers on this issue and, and the biblical example that this is a community decision. And uh, if, if nobody's encouraging you to do it, and if, if you feel this calling, uh, that's probably not the right thing. But you want to have wise counselors around you, um, friends who can speak honestly into your life and uh, situation. So it was a privilege to be a part of those conversations with Colin as we talk through what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what are your desires, uh, what do people see as a primary gifting. And then just to know that the Lord does guide and he does guard us from mistakes and he will uh, put us in the right position to fulfill that aspiration that we might have. That's really good. And I'm sure you'd all agree, it isn't like this is something you do when you're 27 and you never have to think through it again. So this is something that you continue to wrestle with throughout your days. I think I can share this story a few years ago, T4G gathering. John Piper in his 70s at the time was reflecting, asking us, do you think I'm a preacher who writes or a writer who preaches? Still wrestling with his own sense of calling and vocation. And what what what, what do you think we told him? I'd say a writer who preaches who doesn't like going to church meetings. <laughs> no, we all said he was a, a preacher, a preacher who, who writes. Oh, interesting. What would you think? What would you say, Julius? Yeah, that's interesting too. I would say he's a preacher who writes. And and then, interestingly, a lot of people who have asked me, like people who I meet, my barber, I remember the first time I went to a new barber shop, they asked me what I do. And I was I was kind of torn, like, should I tell them I'm a professor at a seminary, yeah. pastor at a church? What do I say? And I actually just said, I'm a pastor who teaches at a seminary. Oh. That's essentially who I am, yeah. you know, okay. because... I take my ministerial call so seriously. When I took my vows before God and the church as a minister of the word and sacrament, but whose primary duty as a minister of the word was to teach and train future pastors, I said, that's what I am. I'm just a pastor. I'm a minister who has spent some specializations. And as a result, who has some gifting in teaching and training and mentoring future leaders. But essentially at the core, I'm just, I'm just a pastor. I'm a shepherd of God's flock. And in this way, I think it's important for me, it's important to remind myself of that, even as the president of TGC, is that essentially I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor called by my, by my church to pastor not only my local church, but the broader church through this parachurch ministry called TGC, who essentially exists to support the local church. And so everything is about the church to me. Yeah. And so for me, I tell a lot of my young students, uh, men, what the, the calling to be a pastor and a shepherd arguably is the highest calling one could ever receive. Christ died for the church. He didn't die for the seminary. He didn't die for a parachurch organization. He died for his people, the church. And so to be a she- to be an under shepherd of the chief shepherd of the sheep, what can be greater than to be a part of that undeniably marvelous ministry of walking Amen. in the footsteps of Jesus. And so I just I keep telling my students we need more pastors. We need more pastors. There's enough professors. We need more pastors. And so that has always been my cry uh, at the seminary for the last 20 years. Uh, So sticking on that theme, I'd love to hear your take, uh, because you taught preaching. 
Uh, I'd love to hear, you can take this in three or four different directions. Some of your favorite books on preaching, tell us a little bit about your book on preaching, but maybe start with, uh, you know, what's, what's your assessment of preaching or to narrow it a bit, if there's somebody listening to this, who's been preaching five, 10, maybe 25 years, uh, how do they get better? What, what in your estimation is, is, you know, maybe the thing or a thing that if you could wave your magic preaching wand, you would you wish preachers could understand or a skill. Give us your homiletician's wizardry here, Julius. How do we need to improve as preachers? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one because there's just it's not unlike mastering other skills, right? Uh, there there are. I was watching the PGA Championship this weekend, and I and I continue to marvel at how skilled these guys are with a metal stick and a round ball, uh, and how they yeah. can. But at, almost at will, decide where that ball is going to go, right? But it took, as you know, to be able to to be at that level. I mean, you're talking hours upon hours. You know, what what does Malcolm Gladwell sell? say? Ten thousand hours at least yeah. to master something. And so, one of the things I tell I tell young preachers as well as old is be patient, because this is something that you can improve on for the rest of your life. And I'm a golfer, and that's one of the things I love about playing golf is that it's a game that I can play for the rest of my life and continue to improve. But at the same time, as you improve, there are certain things that you can do, like go to the driving range and make sure your grips are, whether it's working on the fundamentals of the game or getting coaches to help you fine tune your game who see things that you cannot see in your swing. So similarly, what I would say is if you're a young preacher, make sure you got the fundamentals right. Is your grip right? Is your stance right? Are you are you balancing yourself over your feet? Similarly, in preaching, there are certain things that I believe are foundational to preaching, like the interpretive as well as the organizational and the delivery communicative aspects of preaching. And that's kind of how, if I can do the shameless plug, and that's kind of how I've designed my my book. My book is for, for you know young preachers who are learning how to preach better. And what is what does it mean to interpret the scriptures? doing justice to both the human author, but also the divine author and finding gospel centrality and interpretation while doing justice to the text, but also then organizing it in such a way that's logical and linear and helpful for people for maximum attention and retention, and then delivering it in such a way with passion and, and, and understanding how the brain works so that people actually remember what you say. And so these are some fundamental things that you need to know to begin, or if you haven't ever learned it, to actually learn to become a better preacher. And then for those who have been doing it for a while is find a coach. And there are different coaches that are available to you. My best coach, frankly, is my wife. My wife knows me well. And so she, for my 30 years of preaching, has been extremely instrumental, probably more so in my earlier years, in helping me. Now, I have to admit that 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 created some awkward conversations around dinner at times. My wife is gifted with the gift of bluntness. And uh, so that's always good. (laughs) And so she's always been great, but you know we worked out a system where you know we usually waited not sun we didn't talk about it Sunday on the way home from church when I'm very vulnerable and sensitive. We always waited until Tuesday or Wednesday dinner for her to say, "Hey, did you think about this? Could you think about this? When I heard it, this is what I heard, or when you did this, it seemed to be distracting or whatever." And so I'm like, huh? So my wife has always been a good coach, and you know also as a good coach is actually video, is actually videotaping yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you see things in your communicative style um, and in your messaging, what I call nonverbal messaging, that a yeah. lot of young preachers, even old preachers, don't even realize that they do. And, and I think a lot of church members are willing to overlook a lot of distracting qualities about your delivery because they love you as a person, which is great. But if we want to master our craft, which is to be great communicators and shepherds with our voice and with our body language, then, you know, watching a video. Uh, could be helpful. And then lastly, one last thing is, is finding other mentors like other preachers, gifted preachers who can then help you. And so and that's something that I'm actually thinking about right now as I as I transition over to TGC and I have this gift of teaching preaching and this skill. How can I use that gift at TGC to coach future preachers? And so that's something I'm thinking about. I want to I don't want to replace the seminary. The seminary brings all of that together in a kind of a crucible experience of three, four years. But if there's something that I can do to kind of coach and mentor preachers right now with the skills that I have, maybe that's something that I can that I can maybe establish uh, at TGC. So those are just some thoughts, Kevin, right. about, about uh, preaching. Well, 
for any, any of you guys, who are some of the, the, the preachers, maybe it's sermons that you go back to read, but maybe it's people that you're listening to now who are, who are some of the guys who really encourage you. If you have uh, an hour in the car and you want to listen to a sermon, who might you find on your phone? One of the things that I've I found, Kevin, is Did just you say how... Kevin? No, well, I, thank you. Oh. I can I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I, I, just how personal it is. So I remember thinking about the Gospel Coalition that one of the main things we're committed to is expository preaching. No coincidence that Julius is our president. And then I remember thinking, are we talking about the expository preaching of Tim Keller? Are we talking about the expository preaching of Don Carson? We're talking about the expository preaching of John Piper, because you listen to those three guys. Yeah, pretty different. Very different. And so I'll just say personally, um, as with a lot of lot of my things in life, um, it's it's some combination of Mark Dever and Tim Keller. Um, Now it is one thing. I mean, I I would I probably more when I'm when I'm preaching, I preach more like Mark, so I think I just learn more from him. Uh, Tim is, is different for me, but he challenges me in ways that are just, you know, very, very fascinating. I just learn a lot from him there. Um, but I go back generally to, to, uh, advice that Carson gave me back when I was in seminary, which was one of my biggest blessings was being pastored by Kent Hughes at college church and listening to Kent. And he said, one of the beautiful things about Kent is that you can actually learn how to preach from Kent. You know, his, his process is there. He's very structured. He's very clear. He's incredibly gifted. But you can actually, you can learn from him. Oh, my goodness, Julius and Kevin, you guys must have stories of the people who you can just tell immediately. Like, it can't translate across a lot of cultures. Not every culture. He's going to translate across a lot of cultures. But Piper or Keller especially, that's, I mean, you can... You can spot that kind of person from a mile away. And so in developing my preaching, but also just benefiting from it. One other thing I'll point out, though, is that I remember with with my uh, the pastor of my church, I started to notice that his sermons were really just more engaging lately. And I, I just I liked what I was seeing. So I, I tr- kind of like with kids, I, I try to catch my pastors doing good, <laughs> not doing bad. Nobody likes that kind of person in your church. So just saying, I've just been so impressed and so edified by your preaching lately. And he said, thank you. For a number of weeks, I've only been listening to black huh. preachers. And I could tell. I mean, it was really good. I mean, so it's not his style. And he didn't sound like that. But his imagery was so much more vivid. And it was just, there was a dynamism, and it just, the illustrations were were so much more helpful in some ways. And like, well, that so so I could listen to Tim, and I could listen to Mark all the time. But I also want to push myself to listen to some really different folks who I'm not going to be their style, but I'm going to learn from them. Julius, I want to hear from you. Who who do you listen to? I think one preaching. of the things that I've been careful about, especially when I was preaching more regularly, was actually not listening to anybody at all, uh, because I found that even in my the process of crafting my sermon, I was too tempted to steal a phrase or a line or an idea or even a move, right? Moving from, let's say, interpretation to application. I, and I really wanted to force myself to learn the craft of create, finding my own voice, right? And I think that's a, it's a hard craft, right? It's a hard process to trust that over time, your voice will become greater and better. And so that's one of the first things I did was just not not listen to many, but... I actually love my local pastor. Uh, his name is Ted Hamilton of my PCA church where I serve as an associate pastor. Uh, mm-hmm. Ted really, for me, is right along the Tim Keller line. He's a former attorney. He's a corporate attorney who, after 16 years, went to seminary. And so uh, clearly he has the kind of like John Calvin-esque ability to think through uh, a lot of the content, but then organize it in a way that's very clear and compelling and persuasive. But he's also he's a careful cultural apologist as well for those living in Southern California. So what, what Ted does extremely well is he takes the same type of moves that Tim would make. But Tim does it for people living in Manhattan. Ted does it for people living in San Diego, California, wrestling with their questions and concerns. And so having now listened to him for now 19 years, I can honestly say he's actually getting better every year. So he just did a series through COVID on, on um, the fruit of the spirit and applying the fruit of the spirit 
to how we're treating one another during this COVID experience. And it was phenomenal, excellent, gospel-centered, doing justice to Pauline theology, but at the same time applying it to the current questions, concerns, complaints that people are having in light of this COVID experience. And so uh, I really enjoy Ted's balance there. And uh, so I love listening to him. Thankfully, I get to listen to him every Sunday. No, oh, that's really great. It, it, I just love the reminder, Julius, for any young, any any preacher out there or anybody who's just listening to preaching, it is really hard thing to do. Yeah. I, I, I tell my students that it's it's the closest thing to ex nihilo that that I encounter because you read the commentaries, you study, you got lots of ideas, and there's there's a blank page, there's a blank screen each week. Okay, what where do what direction do I take this? How do I come up with this? And I've just been, I think, convicted, encouraged in the last year or so. Just what you said, Julius. I I want to I want to keep getting better at this. I mean, before the Lord, and it's not going to be finally my ingenuity, but I want to get better at this. I, I listen to other podcasts. Uh, you know, people doing what we do, just talking, and I realize. There are a lot of really smart people out there who write great stuff in other fields, and it's hard to to talk well. Uh, you think about politicians who have an army of people who are speech writers, and they can give the same speech in different places. And a pastor, it's got to do it. You know, very few have anyone helping them with research. You you got lots of books, but you have to do that every single week. And you got to come up with something. I mean, the TED Talks that light the world on fire and go viral, you know, that's 20 minutes that somebody had the opportunity to craft probably over years, give it one time, memorize it. Great. Really, really impressive. Now do that every week for the rest of your life. It's very <laughs> difficult. For sure. And if you're good at it, it will look easy to people. Yeah. They'll think anybody could do that. Of course, when it looks, when it's bad, it's, really bad. It looks I really mean, bad. it's just so painful to see, but yeah, it looks effortless when it's good. So this is life and books and everything. We're going to end now with books, Julius, a uh, few categories. So just give it lightning style. What are some of the most influential Christian books over the years? Give us three, four, five, whatever comes to mind for you as a Christian leader, pastor, the most influential on Julius Kim? Yeah, great question. I'd say as a college student, one of the most influential things in helping me direct me toward Reformed theology and the, the emphasis on the sovereignty of God and the doctrines of grace with J.I. Packer's Knowing God. Yeah. My interest in cultural apologetics uh, was um, How Then Shall We Live, Francis Schaeffer. Uh, that's in my college years. Uh, and then when I got to seminary, Probably the most seminal book for me was actually, I know strange, this may sound strange, but it was actually devotional when I read it too, was, was Calvin's Institutes. I was shocked when I finally read Calvin at how devotional his theology is. That is this marriage of the head and the heart uh, that, that I think a lot of people misunderstand about Calvin. Um, and Calvin's motto was my heart I give to thee, right? Not my, yeah. my brain and my mind. And so Calvin, and then in terms of my theological precision, uh, when I was in seminary, it was Turretin. I really appreciated Turretin's Atlantic Theology. So Calvin Turretin, and then in terms of pastoral theology, as I went through seminary, moving into pastoral ministry and things like that, again, this may sound strange, but in addition to Keller, I, I was reading, well, actually listening to Keller at the time. Who was I reading? I was influenced a lot by in my preaching by Ed Clowney, mm -hmm. Ed Clowney stuff. As Tim um, was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we're both disciples of Ed. Um uh, who else was I reading at the time? Jack Miller. Uh, Jack Miller was actually quite influential in his heart for me, heart for people. Uh, Jack really taught me what it means to have his book, Heart of a Servant Leader, right? Um, and so while I might not agree on everything uh, with Jack, I just I really, when I read his letters in that book, Heart of a Servant sure. Leader, he really profoundly uh, helped me understand what it means to to truly love your people as a shepherd. And um, Henry Nouwen, I think. Again, he's a Catholic mystic, uh -huh. uh, but now and really helped me connect the head to the heart uh, more so. And again, I don't agree with him on everything, but man, here's a guy who tries daily to walk with God, and you can you can his his words just bleed a person who walks with God, right? And and that's what I really want for myself. And so 
Now one's been influential. Eugene Peterson is somebody who's also been very uh, impactful for me again in his, the balance of his theology and life as a pastor and as a Christian. Um, Peterson has always been very influential to me. So those are just some rapid fire names that just come to mind that have influenced me over the years. Any favorite non-Christian books, whether fiction or nonfiction? Yeah, I love historical novels. I love historical fiction and nonfiction. That's just my love of history. So anything historical fiction I love. Um, I'm actually trudging my way through Hamilton. I don't even know how to uh, pronounce his last name, but uh, Chernow. Chern- Chernow. Yeah. So am um, I. Where are you on this, Julius? I'm at Where about 200. I gave up. And oh, you I'm gave up, to Kevin? Give up I did. I'm about okay, to give so, up. So I should reasons not, why. I should not bother is what you guys are telling me. I'm fine. I, I need people. I, I am the most I just, stubborn reader alive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Chernow for me, he's a little over the top in his writing style. So this is more of a stylistic thing for me. He's a little over the top and it's almost like he wants to impress me with his, his knowledge of even his, it's like, does, is he writing with a thesaurus next to him? It's like, it seems like every paragraph, there's a word that I don't know. And well, I we've think talk- I'm a fairly well-read guy. We, I we've, think. we've talked about this on this podcast before. Okay. Tommy Kidd, our good friend who just says, Look, if your biography is longer than 250 pages, I don't understand what you're doing here. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, so it's not not just the thesaurus, but also just the sheer length. And so, I mean, I felt like, oh man, COVID. I, I've been I've been playing piano again. I'm going to pick up Hamilton. No, yeah, I would. No, I don't think I you do need it. it personally. Yeah, I don't uh, think you need to read the whole thing. Well, That's just you're my, my boss, Julius. So I take, yeah, yeah, take you should don't waste your time on that. Yeah, read my book, Colin. <laughs> Okay. Um, I've already read your book. Okay, sorry, sorry. By the sorry, way, you sorry, need sorry, to sorry. say what it is. Tell us what your book is. Yeah, it's called Preaching the Whole Counsel of God. It's uh, put out by Zondervan. Sorry, Justin. And um, <laughs> it's to design and deliver gospel-centered sermons. And so it's really a. It's essentially bu- uh, made for. It's uh, essentially designed to help first-year, second-year preaching students at the seminary. But really, anybody can pick it up because in it, I try to help anybody who has to teach the Bible. Frankly, teach anything learn some foundational things of how to, how to put together a structured and organized thought uh, idea and then deliver it in a way for maximum attention, retention, and then hopefully by the Holy Spirit's power, transformation. So uh, what am I reading now? I'm reading actually two, in two main areas, Kevin. And I'll show you what I'm doing at TGC President. I'm reading books on race. I think I need to yeah. be more well-versed in that. So I'm actually working my way through uh, Ibram Kennedy's book, Stamp from the Beginning. Hmm. I've already worked through some other books. And so that's a, that seems to be a seminal work that a lot of people refer to. Yeah. So I'm working my way through Ibram Kendi's book. But on the other hand, you you introduced a book by Smith on on institutional intelligence. Yeah. Uh, so I'm working through that as well. So those are my two big areas of reading right now is on race and justice issues, but also on institutional management and leadership. And so that's what I'm reading now. All right. L- last question just so you know real life i'm getting texts my son i I dropped them off fishing somewhere can you come asap and it's pouring out and i can testify it is pouring out so this is how much i love you the listener my children are getting pouring wet but is it true julius to quote the moody blues that you are just a singer in a rock and roll band (laughs) how did you hear how did you know yeah, well, tell us you're uh, you're you are really musical, like not just uh, yeah. It, you know, I taught myself GCD on the guitar in college, but you you actually play. Give us a little bit, brag on yourself, okay? What would your wife oh. say to brag on you about your musical abilities? Yeah, you clearly you don't know G very well. She would okay, never. Okay, she wouldn't brag. On me. On yeah, me. it would be the opposite. As a good <laughs> Korean wife, she would put me down. She would think that putting me down, she's actually elevating me. Okay. But so that's good. the Korean way. But um, let's try the American way, since I'm a Korean and an American. Yeah, let's uh, do let's... it. We we boast in our glories <laughs> in America. <laughs> so this this seems uh, appropriate here. Um, yeah, so ever since I was in, a young man, I, I loved the guitar. I loved music. And so I thought I was actually going to be a music major in college. I dabbled in it for a little bit. I was a biblical studies major and then a music minor. So I play guitar, I play piano, I did voice, and then I decided there's no future in this at all. 
And so wisely, I chose the pastoral ministry, which, which of course, is much more lucrative fiscally. Much and good. so more of a hit on say, TikTok. Yeah. And so <laughs> over the years in, in church ministry, I served by using the gifts of music. So I, I used to be, you know, lead music through guitar, piano, voice, through, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Um, and then more recently, uh, providentially, and then when I was in high school, college, you do the requisite high school garage band, college garage band. I try to do that for a little bit and primarily playing covers. I try to dab a little bit in, in uh, original music, but primarily just covers. And then more Can recently, we find good... this group on YouTube. No, I want to know. Oh. What was I the want... name of it? What was Video, your name? Videos did not exist at the time. What was the name of the band? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to well, tell you. Tell me who you uh, were covering. You don't want to see me in a mullet with earrings, okay? I'm no, kidding. Tell... Don't yeah. imagine me with a mullet with earrings. It... Tell us at least what covers you were doing. What kind of bands you were Yeah, covering. so back then we were doing primary. Well, there was a Christian rock music stage. So I don't know if you remember that in the 80s. Yeah. When I was really into, like, I didn't do Petra, which was like the heavy metal oh, yeah. Christian. So in, in Southern California, there was a group of musicians uh, that we all loved. It was like Undercover, 441, and all these smaller Christian bands. Okay. And so we were trying uh -huh. to emulate them. So back then we were trying to be the next U2. Or the next alarm. Alarm was another Christian band out of it, yeah. out of Ireland. That uh, so that was kind of my thing at the time. And then later, fast forward. Oh, this is about ten years ago. Uh, a good friend of mine, ruling elder at my church, got diagnosed with with blood cancer, with multiple myeloma, and uh, fifty some years old at the time, and was really depressed driving home from the doctor, and happened to pass by a music store, and he went in. And bought the guitar he's always wanted his whole life, which is a, which is a Gibson ES three thirty five, the, the oh. kind Chuck Berry plays, yeah. Cherry Red ES three thirty five. That's not expensive. That's not cheap. Bought that guitar and then bought an amp, brought it home. Wife says, "What are you doing?" I said, "Honey, I've been diagnosed with cancer. I might die within a year. I'm going to start a band." No joke. Uh -huh. Calls me to Julius. I, I I remember you used to play in a band when you were young. Do you want to get together and jam? I said, sure. No idea that he was diagnosed with cancer. So let's just jam, right? Let me call a buddy of mine. He plays the bass. Let me call another buddy of mine. He plays the guitar. So we meet at the church and I play guitar. So the four of us, he said, well, we should actually have some ideas. All right, let's, let's play Roar Orbison, Pretty Woman. Let's play yeah. the Eagles, you know? So let's play the Beatles. You know, it's kind of like the standard 50s, 60s, 70s music that everybody loves dancing and singing along to. Yeah. So we chose those music, got the chord sheets, listened to it, played it, and we played about four songs in this hour. And then he told us why we're mm. playing. And he goes, guys, I have cancer. And then as we're trying to fight back tears, we're like, well, what do we want to do with this? He goes, let's start a wedding band. And so that started <laughs> a wedding band called The Decades. We were called The Decades. Oh, that's good. The Fabulous Decades. And, uh, and so we played several weddings. We played Fourth of July. We played a large event twice, two years in a row for the city of Redlands. I know it doesn't sound like much, but for the city of Redlands, they have like this big fireworks show that the city puts on. And it was at Redland, University of Redlands Stadium. And we played in front of like 12,000 people. And uh, wow. so had an opportunity oh, cool. to play little gigs like that. And, um, you know, wow. for me, it wasn't about the money. It was uh, just being with my buddy uh, who was dying of cancer. And he, he actually passed away four years ago. And so the, mm. the band stopped. So we haven't, I haven't played in a band since. Feels kind of weird actually to yeah. to play again. It was a special moment. It was a special time period of about two three years uh, where we played with him. He was the lead singer. I played I played guitar and bass depending on the song, and so that was kind of my little short wedding band career. Oh, that's great. Bittersweet, but a great story. I hadn't heard that before. Julius, we'll have to have you back. We didn't get to hear enough about your your lovely, blunt Korean wife <laughs> and your, your two equally lovely, I'm sure, daughters. But thank you for being with us. Thank you for, for your years of training ministry students at Westminster, continuing to do that in a different capacity. Thank you for... Uh, coming on board to serve TGC as president. We're thrilled that you're in this role. Grateful to have you at the helm and to have you as our friend as well. So thank you, brother, for being here. Thank you for having me. What a pleasure. Look forward to uh, being with you all next time.